It says God gives to every soul freedom to think, to follow his own conscience. It's not your business to start making your conscience their law, a law for them. No, 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 no. It's very clear here. No one is to control another mind, another's mind. It's not our business. If someone believes this is a practice or whatever practice they're doing is okay for them, and you have nothing that is clear in the Bible about it, it's what we call gray areas, then it's not your business to try to correct them. Okay? It's not your business. I'm, I'm not saying this. Spirit of prophecy is saying this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? It's very clear. So, moving forward, yes. Yeah, I wanted, that's the latter part of this uh, quote. In all matters where principle is involved, so there's a principle, a law, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Romans 14, verses 12 and 5, I think it is. In Christ's kingdom, there is no lordly oppression, no compulsion of man. Don't try to guilt somebody into going by your conscience. That is against the principles of love. Don't use guilt that is, just because you believe it's wrong, doesn't mean it's wrong for them. We need to be careful about this. And the angels of heaven do not come to the earth to rule and to exact homage, but as messengers of mercy to cooperate with men in uplifting humanity. Okay? They don't even exact homage. Okay? It's very clear the Bible says. Holy Spirit's role for the conscience. We've been talking about living with a pure conscience. We've been talking about how to respect others. What is the Holy Spirit's role? I've alluded to this a little bit earlier. Let's read in John 8, 9. And you know the context. The man had caught this woman in adultery and had brought her to Jesus. Now what do you say, Jesus? Oh, and those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Mm. We know the story, right? Jesus began to write in the sand, right? We don't know what he wrote there. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy gives us insight into that, that he wrote some sins there. And that's why they walked away. They couldn't judge her, because they were as guilty as she was. May not be the same sin, but there were sins that they were dealing with. Who are we to judge? We point one finger to one person, and four are pointing back to us. You ever think of that? We need to be careful in matters of the conscience. All right? Yes, I, I want to share the uh, story of, uh, of a Seventh-day Adventist uh, lady who was married to a, a non-SDA spouse. And uh, one time I, I wasn't trying to censor her or anything, okay? I want you to know that. She just brought up, you know, I go to, I go to dance with my husband. I go for exercise, it's just ballroom dancing, pretty casual, pretty easy to go. And I don't know if she was trying to uh, ask if I was okay with that, but in her mind, she's already decided that it was okay for her. Who am I to judge her? Oh, we don't dance, period, right? What is her rationale behind it? Love, right? Is this a matter, if you want to call it compromise, call it what you want, is this matter an issue of salvation? 
And if I don't do this, think about her situation, what would the husband think? There are some matters that are detrimental to our ourselves, but is that a matter of uh, salvation? The Bible doesn't say that, right? If you read Galatians 5, 19 and 21, it talks to you about what will, uh, what sin that people will lose their salvation over. And so, she felt comfortable dancing with her husband, and that's who she danced with. She didn't dance with nobody else. And, um, oh, I, I know. Some of you are thinking now. I got you thinking. What do you do with that? I didn't, I didn't go around, oh, you're wrong, and guilt her. Would I do that? I don't know. If I was in her shoes, I don't know what I would do. If I was in the same situation as her, I don't know what I would do. But I'm not about to be her God and Lord over her and oppress her for what she's doing. You understand what I'm saying? Does this make sense? I'm not about to do that. There are issues that are not worth the fight to die on that hill. And there are issues that perhaps is worth the fight. So, I know I'm bringing up some sensitive stuff, but we need to be careful when we think we're so holy and we're so right and we can prove every little thing about it, but somebody else's conscience thinks different. It's not our business to make our conscience their conscience. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not our business. I read that, didn't I? Are we with me? Are you with me? Is that clear? You're quiet, I know. But this is an important matter. If we don't get this right, that is, if you want to know why you're not bearing fruit, you're not bringing souls to Christ, this might be one of those areas. Okay, might be. Because you can repel people from the gospel by your actions. You can. It is always humiliating to have one's errors pointed out. None should make the experience more bitter by needless censor. Ah, needless censor. No one was ever reclaimed by reproach, but many have thus been repelled and have been led to steel their hearts against conviction. By your actions, they actually said, if that's the way they're going to be, I'm not changing my way. That's what it's saying here. They go against their conviction. They, because of the attitude you can present, you can lose a soul over that. Isn't that something? A tender spirit, a gentle, winning deportment may save the airy and hide a multitude of sins. What kind of a spirit? A judgmental spirit? A guilt complex spirit? A, a oppression spirit? No! A tender spirit. A gentle, winning deportment may save the erring and hide a multitude of sins. So this is matters of principle, right? It's on the principle. The Holy Spirit's role is what? You're not the Holy Spirit. You are not the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think we are. We are to be witnesses and allow the Holy Spirit to convict. We can repel people by the way and mannerism that we act towards them because we feel they are doing something something that in your mind, in your conscience, is wrong. Beware and be careful when you go into that direction. Okay? The Ten Commandment Law is a standard, I know that. But even in that, there are, area, if you want to call it, gray area, matters of the conscience, and so you need to be careful. Okay? 
Um, what else shall we say? I gotta watch my time here. All right, let's go to the next slide. How to have a good conscience. How to have a good conscience. Hebrews 9, 14, I hope we've already been talking about how to do that. But even more specifically, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Wow. The blood of Christ. To cleanse your conscience. So if you have defiled your conscience because you went against God's principle, God's way, the Bible says you can be cleansed. Isn't that good news, friends? There's good news. And therefore, as you are cleansed, you are can now have a pure conscience. Amen? You can now have a pure conscience. And so, it's clear to me that the Holy Spirit has a major role in guiding us into all truth. But sometimes people haven't come to that understanding that you have. And we must be patient and gentle while, they, while the Holy Spirit is working in their life. All right. How to have a good conscience. 2 Timothy 1.3. The Bible says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying here that I serve God with a pure conscience. Was he trying to boast here? He would only boast in Christ crucified and his blood. Right? We know Paul. We know the Apostle Paul wasn't bragging. What he's saying is, I thank God. It is God that gives him that pure conscience. Only God can give you that. And through his blood, through your confession of sin to him alone, you can have that good conscience. Romans 2.15, conscience bears witness. We've alluded to this also, but I just want to give you a, uh, a verse here that uh, gives a little uh, other side or another angle to it. Romans 2.15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. So they show. We talked about living with a pure conscience, the testimony of a good conscience, like Paul said. And so we can demonstrate Christ's way through the, through the conduct and behavior that we understand to be true. And the law is written in their hearts. They love to serve God. This is not talking about... Uh, Disobeying God's law, what I've talked to you about here today. It's a matter of conscience and not judging others. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, allowing people the freedom to think and allow the freedom to grow in Christ. Does that make sense? Some people think jewelry completely, no jewelry. Some say, a wedding ring is fine. Some say a little bit of jewelry, like a necklace. It's not a door, it's not expensive. Who am I to judge what level they feel before God is correct? Who am I to judge? You believe total abstinence of no jewelry, maybe. But somebody else has a ring or a necklace or a watch, and you feel they are sinning. Your conscience tells you one thing. Somebody else says, no, it's still modesty. That's the principle, right? Modesty. Right? Modesty. So be guided by the principle. And so we won't be going around messing with other people's conscience. <laughs> okay. Do we, do we get that, right? We've got to be careful about stepping on other people's feet. 
when it comes to matters of conscience. I know some, some of you have questions, and this is not interactive today, but you can talk to me later if you have any concerns what I've shared is not biblical. Um, I have no problem with that. To make, um, yeah, so judgment. Let's close this up. I'll finish this. This is my summary here. Conclusion, we have attempted to explain how to live with a pure conscience before God and before others through Christ's love. Amen? We have discovered that we cannot judge another man, man's conscience even if we believe we have it right. It is not my right to judge them by what they allow or permit compared to what I allow or permit. Clear? Number three, may we truly be convinced in our mind what we believe, but beware that we do not place that judgment upon another person who believes and loves God like yourself. That one's a little harder for us to, to grapple with. But, true, right? That's what we, we, we studied all this today. If you didn't hear that, now you're hearing it again. Number four, let us live with a pure and undefiled conscience guided by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Okay? And number five, let love rule over all our decisions and may all the fruit of the Spirit be alive in us as we witness for Christ. I pray that this has been a uh, blessing to you, and we will now have our closing hymn, 516, all the way. Yeah, I think that's the correct one. And Brother um, Mikael will lead in that song, and we have it on, on the slide projector. Sing song, let's all stand and sing all the way.
Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being with us throughout this Sabbath morning worship and coming to you in the Word. Thank you for revealing your truths to us. Lord, we pray that you will continue to guide us, direct us, that we may have this testimony that we live with a pure conscience. And the only reason is because of what Jesus did on the cross and his blood can cleanse our seared, our defiled conscience. Even today, if we've defiled our conscience, Lord, forgive us, wash us, and cleanse us from this wrongdoing that we may live a pure, righteous life in you and have this testimony of the love of Christ shining through us. That's our hope and prayer. Lord, bless each one here. Give them of your spirit. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I just have a quick couple of announcements. One is Sabbath school. Sabbath school is uh, on at 3 o'clock on Zoom. If you don't have the Zoom link, just uh, uh, you can send an email to Edwin, myself, or Murray. They are the two teachers. All right. And that's at 3 on Zoom link. The uh, one that we use for Sabbath. Okay. Uh, the other thing I would like to let you know is if you need a Sabbath school quarterly, we have them in the back. Just ask uh, people, uh, someone will know where to get it from, okay? In the office there. And those that are designated for cleaning their section, please do so. The, the wipes are in the back pew and uh, just to help clean up uh, the area that was used. You don't have to clean all the pews, the ones that aren't used, just the ones that were used, okay? We have to do that in between services. The next service is coming at 11.15. So we have some time if you want to talk with somebody, we have time. But just as long as we're completely out by, let's say, 11.10. And the way you come out is through these doors and out to the parking lot, past the prayer room. It's only because we don't want to jam up in the foyer. People will stop in the middle and you have to kind of walk around and it creates a jam up, okay? So it's a lot more smoother this way when you're ready to leave. Okay, thank you. God bless. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Happy Sabbath.